Okay, great, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the College Counseling Preview Program for grade 10 students and parents. As most of you know, we did do this presentation in person for students who were um, in school last week. And tonight is our version for parents and students who are online. We wanna let you know that you don't need to take any notes. We are gonna be sending you these slides afterwards. We will also send out a recording of this presentation for anyone who's not able to make it and would like to review the contents. And we also wanna let you know that this is actually a preview program. This is looking ahead in college counseling to what your child's experience will be like and what your experience as a parent will be like as you um, get into the junior and the senior year. We start with this slide up front. We were so proud of one of our junior students for getting the graphic said, what is this? And a student raised his hand and said, that's the yellow brick road. And we said, yes, it's from Columbus Academy to college. And that's a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Next slide. So I am Darnell Haywood and I am one of the college counselors here. And I am part of the most wonderful college counseling team. Um, this group of college counselors loves kids, loves working with students on the college search and selection process. And we have a background in admissions and in teaching, and we are thrilled to be part of the journey for uh, students and parents in this process. Um, we love this work, and we are excited to shepherd you all through this. We want to start with just the obvious. I mean, last year at this time, we had this presentation in person. I think it was the last big in-person presentation um, at Columbus Academy. And since then, we have had all of our programming on Zoom. Um, we have started to open up as a school and it's so wonderful to see students here. But the world that we've experienced in college counseling and at Columbus Academy is reflective of the world that's going on in college admissions. In my 19 years as a college counselor, I would say that this is the most sort of cloudy college landscape that I've really seen. And we'll go into more detail about that for you all. We thought you all might wanna hear some of the statistics that keep coming out every day about colleges and universities. But the one that stood out to me this past week is that um, when students apply to college, this senior class, class of 2021, applied to college using the common application, only 44% of those students submitted test scores. And in the previous year, 77% had submitted test scores. So we are watching all these trends and um, following what's happening and, and are excited to share some of this with you. Next slide. Okay, so tonight's agenda, what we are gonna be talking about is a little bit about the philosophy of college counseling at Columbus Academy. We're gonna be showing you some tips and some tools on um, how to dive into what we call the largest school project ever, um, figuring out a little bit about college counseling. We're gonna give you some primary sources information where we get data and where we think data is helpful for understanding college admissions. And we are gonna ground this in what we think is um, for all of our students, the possibility of a joyful journey of learning about themselves, learning about their academic interests, learning um, about where they might like to be in the world and maybe where they would not like to be. And in that process, then culminating and finding a match for college. Um, we're gonna to touch on these topics and we'll go into many of them in more detail um, at further programs and with you all individually, grade 10 parents and students on this um, conference in the grade 10 academic planning conferences where you'll have some individual attention. Next slide. So just the big picture here is that I think that it's really important for you all to understand that in the big picture here, 100% of Columbus Academy students are accepted at four year colleges and universities, that our students typically go to 55 to 60 different colleges every year. And these are the facts year in and year out. And 
our entire philosophy in college counseling revolves around finding the right fit for students. And I think that it's important to realize that we cannot speed up time. We don't know where this journey will take us. It is a, it is a journey with ups and downs and parts of this, but at the end, we think that students will be matched with a college where they will go and start their journey after Columbus Academy. We wanna let you know that we have a plan for Columbus Academy students. Um, we uh, keep them on a pretty tight schedule in terms of what steps they need to follow in terms of essays and application pieces and you know, requesting recommendations. Um, so we will help with that scaffolding piece for our students. Um, at the same time that we are sort of letting them know, you don't start this process with, where can I get in? You know, where am I, what am I gonna, what are the places that are going to accept me? Because we, we don't know that year in and year out. But instead, we want them to think about their strengths and their values, what they want out of the college experience. And, um, and to know that that will happen in the 11th and the 12th grade year. I think it's important to recognize that this process is really a marathon and not a sprint. And in our experience, students have a good 14 months that they can spend on this. And after that, they're done. So we don't want students starting too early and burning out, um, burning out on this process, on this topic. We want them ready to go when we get into the junior year. Now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, wonderful colleague, John Wagshall, who's gonna share some information. Thanks and good evening, everybody. Great to be with you all tonight. And just uh, to build on, on what was just being said, I wanna add, you know, it's uh, when we talk about fit, it, so much of it, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, that's a very impressive place, good for you. It's really a matter of saying, is this a place where you're gonna have a great four years because it's the right fit? Um, communication. Very important for us, and we know it's very important for you. So for parents, we really wanna urge you to uh, look for information from college counseling or about college counseling in the Viking Voice, looking for uh, reminders and updates. Uh, for students, check your email. And uh, for you students who are with us tonight, I really wanna emphasize this point because I know that you're gonna be getting a ton of emails and following the emails is not always the easiest thing to do, but it's gonna be really important to stay uh, um, current with the information that we're sending you by email. And of course, there's our, our Twitter account that we want to invite everybody to, uh, to uh, look into as well. All right, and next slide. Um, so we want to talk to you all about the, the steps to a happy college process. And these are really this, these three parts to the process, the self-reflection and the college research, and then the application and selection process. And tonight, we're really focusing on the first two. And in particular, I really want to urge you to focus with us tonight on the first one, which we think is the most important part of all. So important, and um, yet it's the part that people often want to overlook and jump straight to the research. Um, but this is a, a, a really big deal, the self-reflection piece. And as you look at the picture on the slide and you're seeing these happy faces, um, that's what's ahead for our students, um, especially when you work with us in the process that we're laying out for you here uh, this evening, starting with self-reflection. So if we go to the next slide, I wanna just drill down a little bit more on what we're talking about when we, when we think about self-reflection. And some of this is sort of stating the obvious, but it bears stating uh, you know, things like, what are my strengths? What am I proud of? What are my challenges? What do I need to work on? Um, how do I learn best? What is the setting that's gonna work best for me? Are there certain kinds of situations where, I'm, where I know I'm gonna thrive and others where maybe not so much? For example, um, I went to college in a city, but my college wasn't exactly in the city. It was sort of on the edge of the city. And we had a very traditional campus with a lot of green space and uh, you really felt like you were on a college campus. Um, but there was another opportunity to go to college downtown, um, another, very good school, um, but I knew it wasn't the fit for me, the downtown school, because at that point in my life, that wasn't the environment where I was going to feel safe and at home and in my element where I was going to be able to do my best work. 
And so that's just something I knew about me. And those are the kind of things that people want to reflect on as they're considering uh, college options. For parents, um, really want to invite you to be working with your children, with the students in this area. Um, how can you work with your student to help them uh, reflect on uh, their, their strengths and their challenges and what might ultimately be the, uh, the best uh, fits for them? Um, and, and parents, some of these considerations may be ideas that you uh, talked about in conferences with teachers that might have given you some food for thought on what are some of the uh, character uh, strengths or challenges or traits that you want to be considering in this process. Okay. And um, yeah, continuing with self-reflection, beginning in January, of, the, uh, of their junior year, the students are gonna get involved in the college counseling class. And in the early stages of that class, uh, which we really enjoy teaching, by the way, uh, the kids, the students are gonna have an opportunity to actually do a, um, some surveys like a personality profile and a learning styles inventory. And this is gonna be a really helpful piece in the self-reflection process that we've been talking about. And with that, I want to pass it over to my colleague, Jen Fitzpatrick. Jen. Okay, hi, everybody. So I'm going to pick up where John left off and just talk a little bit about self-reflection as an exploratory phase. And really, the, the very basics of this are thinking about potential majors, not as a 10th grader. We don't think you need to know what you want to do with the rest of of your life as a 10th grader, but just starting to think about it in these terms. So if you look at this screen, this is a college board, a career exploring piece of the college board website. This is something that if you're really excited to get started, this is where you would start. If you wanted to do something this weekend, this is what you would do. So on the college board explore careers page, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do, but you see these questions, what are you into? So if you say, gosh, I love animals or I love gadgeting and experiments, when you click on one of these options, you will be given a list of potential careers and then potential majors that go with those careers. Um, it's fun to start poking around and thinking about these things. And this is just an organized way for you to do it. Another page of the College Board will let you know, for those of you who say, well, I think I know the area that I'm interested in. So maybe I'm interested in arts and humanities, what are some majors in that particular area? Or if you say, I, I know I like STEM, but I certainly don't know every major available in STEM. We find that students tend to know five careers. They know their parents, they know their neighbors, they know a trusted friend or a parent's colleague. And that's kind of their circle as a high school student. They know about doctors, they go to the pediatrician. They know about a very small circle of careers. Our job is to help them learn about things that they know about and discover things that might be good fits and matches that they haven't even considered yet. Okay, this is a great website. This is free. This is called Road Trip Nation. So Road Trip Nation has three to five minute videos about different careers. So if you say, oh my goodness, one of my teachers told me once, um, I could totally see you in neuroscience and you're thinking as a 10th grader, I have no idea what neuroscience is. You can go into uh, Road Trip Nation, put that in as a, as a potential, and you will get a little three-minute video from a, a professional neuroscientist that tells you a little bit, about, little bit more about this. Okay, we also want to tell you about the College Board's college search feature. So um, parents, you may know this as like eHarmony, um, you know, finding a mate. Kids, I want you to think about this as eHarmony, but instead of finding a mate, you're going to find potential colleges that match what you are interested in. So we would much rather you start with, these are a list of my must haves, right? So I really want a particular size of school. I have a particular major in mind, a particular sport. You see the things in gray. Those are all categories that you can pick and input some data. And this particular website will give you a list of schools. So we're gonna show you how it works. And I hope my technology does not fail me. Okay, so on the College Board website, this is the very basic College Board website. You click College Search. Darnell and John, give me a thumbs up if you, if you can see what I hope people are seeing. Okay, great. So on this College Search page, you start with 3,690 colleges. That's far too many colleges to consider. And parents back in the day, you would have started with a big, thick college guidebook 
that was the size of a phone book. Your kids don't even know what a phone book is. And you had to thumb through and read about colleges. This is a way to narrow it down to colleges that are just ones that have your specific features in mind. So let's say we know that we want a four-year college. Watch the number, it just took off 1,500 schools. Um, I'm gonna use this as a particular criteria. I know that I want small to medium. I'm now down to 1657 in two clicks. Location, let's say that my mom told me she really wants me within a day's drive of my home in Westerville. I'm down to 479. Uh, campus, let's say for a major, um, I really want to do computer science. I'm down to 194 schools. Oh, my college, my high school coach has been encouraging me to explore the idea of playing lacrosse, but I'm only five foot five and I'm not gonna get any taller. So I think I'm limited to division three. I'm kind of slow, division three lacrosse. Okay, I am down to 43 colleges that have all of these criteria. I'm gonna close and see the results. These are 43 schools. We've gone from almost 3,700 down to 43 schools in about 60 seconds. This is a really easy way to get a list of schools that meet your criteria. Okay. It's an easy place to start if you're a 10th grader. Okay, so once you're in that College Board website and you click on a college, I'm gonna choose Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. There is a wealth of information about schools on this website. I've chosen to go to the applying right here, the applying tab, because I wanna see some of their application numbers. So very quickly, I can see the selectivity of, of Spelman. I can see the size. I can see the number of applications. I can even see how much it costs to apply to Spelman. Here's another school. So here's Northwestern. Total number of applications, how many kids they put on a wait list, how many kids they took from a wait list. And you can see an overall admit rate here of about 8%. This is a really quick, easy way to get data on colleges. We love data. I'm going to turn it back over to Darnell, who's going to tell you a little bit more about data. Yes, so when you are wondering, okay, how do they do that? How do they accept 8% of students? And what is involved with that process? We wanna go over some of that with you. And we wanna tell you that one of the primary sources out there is from the common data set. So you can Google common data set for any school and you'll get the information, the institutional research about that specific school. So we're gonna do a little role play and show you um, how this works and how this can be used in an easy way. Okay, Jenny. Oh, hi, Jenny. You coming in for your college counseling appointment? Oh, oh hi, Miss Haywood. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm here for my very first appointment as a junior, oh, I'm but so I'm excited. I know, Jenny, I'm so excited to see you. And I love it because you've been excited about college for a long time. Oh, yeah, I'm ready. And I've got great news. I know that you have to have all these meetings with your other students, but I, I've got this down pat. I already know where I want to go. Um, I look really good in red. I love surfing. Um, I know it's Ohio, but I spend my whole summer surfing. I have all this family in California. My dad got me a sweatshirt. Do you want to know where I'm going? Jenny, that would be great. Stanford. Oh, Jenny. Oh, it's so great. I, you know, you, you, you might remember in our grade 10 conference that we talked a little bit about research, about yeah. looking, um, you know, into the data. That's why I'm here. Okay, good, good. So Jenny, I love your enthusiasm. I love that you want to go to California. And with that tan that you have, I know that you want to go on and be in the sun in Thank California. You for but let's dig into Stanford okay. a little bit. All right, and let I me know... look at your computer. Let me okay, see. okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the common data set and we're going to do some research on Stanford. Jenny, you know, I know you're really good at math. Tell me what you see in this data? Um, I see that they get a lot of applications, like 47,000 applications. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that looks hard. I know, I know. And look at that. They, they of the women that applied 22,760, they, they were only admitting 1,000. Jenny, I, tough. I know, I know you, you know, you, you have some strengths, right? So, but yeah. let's dig into it a little bit more. Um, and... Okay, that's hard, but I'm going to be really like my dazzling personality. I'm going to wow them in the interview. 
Yes. Okay. Let's dig into this okay. research a little bit more. Maybe we'll go to the next slide. Oh, and see. man. Jenny, so as you can see that the interview is considered for Stanford. Why isn't that as important as my grade? I don't know. That's what they have decided. What are the important factors in their decision there? And that's where they put the interview. So okay. I think what we want to do, I, I think California sounds like a good trip for yeah. you. Yeah. Is there any place else you can think of? My friends say you're really good at like giving suggestions. <laughs> okay. So, good. I, I hope so, Jenny. Yeah. I hope so. Where else, where else would you think a, a kid like me like should, should Jenny, consider? I, one of the most beautiful campuses in the whole world is in Malibu. It's called Pepperdine. And it's, it's, it's a place that I think you might really like. Medium size, smaller. Let's go see what happens with the common okay. data set at Pepperdine. Ooh, I like it. Looks a little bit better, like not 5%. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes. So Jenny, it is. So I think it's still what pretty I, selective. it's still pretty selective. You are right. So I'd say it's a good one to look at. I okay. think we want to widen your list, but let's see what qualities they look at at Pepperdine. Okay. Okay. See now, what do you see here? Okay. So this is going to be a good fit for me because I'm very involved with Miss Benning and the service board. Yes. So I see that that's really important to them. Yes. But also I'm a very involved person at my church. I'm an altar server. So it looks like that's something they consider too. So yeah, that is, I mean, they don't care about the interview very much either. But I've got some <laughs> other things that are like extracurricular activities. I'm super involved. Okay, good. Yeah. So this is the things that they have valued that they have put down there for you. And, and one of the things that I do point to, because you mentioned the church, this is a Christian university. I didn't know that. Uh, yes. And so that is something that, you know, you would want to know about before okay. you go see school. And that's great. Cause that, okay, that seems, seems like, like a good fit for me. That seems okay. like a good fit. Okay. Well, we're not going to send you to California just to see one school. Well, and surf. And yeah. Surf. Yeah. Okay. So, and surf. We want, we definitely want you to have time surfing. But Jenny, go to the next slide. Let's see what else might be available for okay. you. Okay. Here's Harvey Mudd. Um, you know, that's one that we can look up. I look at those numbers. That one is easier to get into as a female than as a male. Um, it's still kind of hard to get into. So, I mean, it's worth seeing, but I think I'll, I'll consider it. Yeah, but here are some other ones. You know, I think you probably want to go to the Bay Area and to Southern California. Okay. And I look at your numbers and I see you as getting in, at, you know, some of these places on here. So I'm going to suggest you go and research uh, University of San Francisco, Santa Clara, University of the Redlands, Occidental. That sounds awesome. I think those would be good ones to so see. So I could spend like four or five days visiting schools in California and getting some surfing in. I think that sounds like a great trip. I really appreciate all of your suggestions. Oh, Jenny, you are just one of the most positive students. I love working oh, with you. I can't wait to come back for my next meeting. Okay, good. Okay, take care, Jenny. Thanks, Miss Haywood. Bye. 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 Take care. Okay, Jenny is, is going to go back to her role as a college counselor and, um, and gonna pass it on over to um, John Wagshall. Um, so here we go, John, you can take it from the role play into getting to know the admissions landscape. <laughs> well, that is a tough act to follow with getting to know the admissions landscape, but let's, let's talk about the admissions landscape. We wanna to talk to y'all first off about uh, this organization that you see in the heading on this slide, and you may have noticed it earlier in the presentation as well, NACAC, the National Association for College Admission Counseling. And this is made up of college counselors and also college admissions officers. And um, we are all together part of a, of a national conversation relating to the college admissions process. And the three of us here, uh, your college counselors, we are very involved in this national conversation. Um, it's interesting to us. We enjoy it. It's at the heart of what we do. Um, and so this is something that we're able to share with you. And NACAC publishes each year its state of college admission report, um, which you can access. And this is where so much of the data that concerns us is coming from. And one of the things that we really look for is trends. And so let's talk about the trends just a little bit as we as we get to the next slide. And a big trend right now has to do with um, applications and selectivity. And in particular, it's how we're seeing schools with very low admit rates are seeing uh, the greatest growth or seeing growth in application numbers. Not every school is seeing growth in application numbers. In fact, some of them are seeing declines, but the schools with the low admit rates the numbers are going up, especially as it relates to 
the uh, early rounds, early action or early decision. But we want to take this opportunity to put this in context for y'all a little bit. Okay, so of the 3,700, approximately 3,700 schools out there, about 100 of them are colleges that get a lot of media attention that for a lot of y'all might be places that you think of as, as household names. And you hear a lot about their numbers being up. Um, so that's, but that's only 100 out of roughly 3,700 schools. Um, and, then, and let's put an even finer point on that. Of all those schools, about 1%, 1% uh, of those schools are the ones that we would consider to have very, very low admit rates. I want you to think about this number, 1% of about 3,700 colleges. And so that's a really small number of schools. So the takeaway here and the moral to the story is as we talk about fit and opportunities, uh, there are so many really fantastic schools to be considered that may be great opportunities, um, great fits. And uh, we wanna make sure that we're keeping an open mind uh, to the possibility of taking a hard look at schools that you might not have been thinking about prior to really starting the college search process, but which in fact are gonna be awesome opportunities. And uh, we're going to be in the course of working with the students pointing out some of these opportunities as we look for that, that great fit. So if we can go on to the next slide. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit more about the explosive growth in applications. And we were just talking a moment ago about this growth in applications and it's, it's, it's dramatic. Um, and uh, uh, my colleagues are going to talk to y'all about this a little bit more uh, as it relates to uh, uh, some of these details, like uh, the numbers of schools during COVID that are test optional. But I want to emphasize a couple of other things. One is just the ease of applying with electronic applications and the use of the Common App, and that's certainly increasing applications. Another uh, really big deal that we want to highlight for you all is the fact that uh, this is big business for colleges, and they are working hard through marketing uh, to, uh, to solicit uh, people to apply. Uh, for many of the colleges, I would tell you that uh, there's a sense that their national prestige goes up to the extent they have more applications, and they're able to say no to more people. This is their perception, and so they will go out with mass marketing on this, and I can just share one quick story of a friend who approached me asking for my thoughts on his daughter's situation. And she uh, uh, had received uh, a correspondence from an East Coast school with a super low admit rate. And frankly, she didn't have anything close to the numbers for this kind of school, but they got this correspondence. And he said to me, what do you think? Uh, they must be interested. Maybe, we ought, maybe she ought to go ahead and apply. And I said, ah, and I explained to him what I was just explaining to you all, how um, the fact that she got that correspondence does not necessarily mean that they've taken a hard look and she's a candidate, a great candidate. It's marketing. But they said, oh, we're going to go ahead and apply anyway. So they did. And they, they, that was their prerogative. And unfortunately, but somewhat predictably, it didn't, it didn't work out for her, um, sadly. Uh, but again, making, coming back to the original point, uh, make no mistake, this, there is this business component that we want you all to know know about. And with that, uh, Jen, back over to you. Okay, I have to get my video going, sorry. Okay, so um, this is something that we showed to sophomores last week, and we want to make sure parents at home understand this as well. This is the basic college admissions funnel. So if you are a first year college admissions um, counselor, this is what you learn about. And we want students to know about this because we want you to know some of the lingo that you're going to hear as you start to go through the college admissions process. So first of all, um, you as a junior will be at the very top of this admissions funnel. You will start to receive mail from schools and sometimes you will reach out to schools to get on their mailing list. You are a prospective applicant, a prospective student or what they would call an IQ, an inquiry. So colleges, just what Mr. Wagshaw was talking about, they're reaching out, they're trying to get you interested, they want you to come to campus or in, this, in the case this year, attend their Zoom information sessions. Their job is to move you through the funnel, to take you from somebody who's just looking at that school to somebody who applies to the school. From an applicant, you become an admitted student. Those who apply to those who are selected 
That off to the left, you see that's called the admit rate or selectivity. So you will often hear like, oh, we had a 33% admit rate or our selectivity went down. Last year we admitted 40% and this year we admitted 30%. So when you hear those words, that's exactly what they're talking about. From those students who are admitted, not every student will come, especially if it's a regular decision of lots of choices. The college is gonna talk about a yield rate. So from the 2000 we admitted, we will get 550 students to enroll. That's our yield rate. We often hear students say, I have no power in this process. The colleges hold all the cards. That's not true. The college gets to decide who they admit. That is the only part they get to decide. You decide the college mailing list that you would like to join, sophomores and junior year. We're gonna teach you how to do this. You decide where you're going to apply. You get to cast that net far and wide. And most importantly, you decide where you're going to enroll. We want to empower students to think about you hold the cards. The college just gets to decide if you're admitted or not. But if you do this process right and, and follow, the, follow the steps that we're talking about, you are going to have power in this process. Okay, we want to show you just a couple of quick things. Mr. Wagshill was talking about those numbers. This is a quick flash up we want you to see because oftentimes students will say, oh, my dad said he got in there 20 years ago. Why couldn't I? Look at some of these examples. In 1992, an admit rate, and in 2019, what the admit rate was. We're gonna show you some present day uh, data on the very next screen, but admit rates have fallen dramatically, dramatically. And then this year in particular, we are seeing things that are just explosive rates of application growth. We put a few examples up here just to show you what we mean by this. Typically, we would say something like a five, six, eight percent. Wow, that's a that's a pretty big increase in applications. Um, that's a normal rate of increase. That college admissions officers would feel good about that. To experience 46, 42 percent, 102 percent in some cases, growth in application rates in one year, it's unheard of. So this is really, I hate the word unprecedented. I feel like we say it all the time in the pandemic, but it truly is unprecedented, largely due in part to some of the factors Mr. Wagshill talked about, um, schools going test optional, kids wanting to hedge their bets. Um, the last example you see on the screen, the University of Michigan, they went up 15,000 applications in one year, unheard of. I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Haywood. Okay. So My <laughs> yes. So I hope you all um, are beginning to just get some of the lingo around this and starting to understand the various factors in admissions. And what this slide is about, what we're showing you, is the data from NACAC. They survey all of the colleges and universities that are in their membership and say, what are the factors that are important to you when you read applications? So this is a a general guide to what the most important factors are for most of the colleges. And what I like to see you is that, tell you is that those four at the top um, have really remained the same over all the time that I've been looking at this data. That the grades, the grades in college prep courses, and guess what? Every student at Columbus Academy is enrolled, whatever courses they choose in college um, prep courses, those two things are at the top of this. Colleges, and we'll talk about this more, we'll be looking at trends, we'll be looking, they leave the transcript as kind of a piece of data that they'll look at. So we really like to encourage these sophomores to, to, to recognize that and to recognize, again, one of their factors that they have control in. The other thing I like to show you is, although it's not the most popular for all colleges and universities, some colleges and universities rate extracurricular activities interview, work, all of these things as very important for them. They consider it considerably important. And, you know, we encourage our students to look at those. We have students who are so happy that they're going to places like Center College and DePauw because those colleges place more value on the um, extracurricular activities, on interviews, on, um, you know, some of the ways that they're involved in their school community. And we want to have our students really starting to widen their, um, their thoughts to some of those places. Next slide. So what you see here, this is just blown up because some of you couldn't see that data before, but those top four factors really have remained the same over time. 
And we also always like to mention something about hook factors. Um, you know, college admissions is not a meritocracy. They don't take the highest GPA, the highest numbers, admit kids and wait list or reject the rest. They base their decisions on their institutional priorities. So they might say, we have an undersubscribed major and we want more students to be in the classics, to be studying the classics. So we'll admit those students at a higher rate. They might say, we want more athletes on campus. They might say, we want more underrepresented minority students on campus. Colleges set those agendas and those change from year to year. We saw a real bump in rural students being admitted over the last few years, but we cannot control what the colleges um, mission and institutional priorities are, and those change from year to year. So our best advice to students is to focus on their strengths, on who they are, and develop a well-balanced list of colleges that to apply to that will reward their strengths. Next slide. And I'm passing it over to John Wagshall. Okay, so some of you may already have heard about Maya Learning, uh, and this is the uh, an online platform that we use in the college counseling process. And for those of you who've had children who've gone through this process before, you might've heard of Naviance. And going back uh, about a year and a half, we started, um, actually a little longer than that, we started uh, researching uh, options to Naviance because Naviance was beginning to get competition. And uh, some of the competition was looking like they might be uh, uh, really quality programs. And we, uh, concluded that Maya was looking very, very good, that they were introducing some things that we thought were better than Naviance were gonna be a quality improvement uh, for us and for our students. And so far, it's really been working well. We think it's been um, great for the kids and, uh, and we've uh, found it helpful for us as well. The interfaces seem to be a little bit better, a little more intuitive. And so we, my, we, we'll, we'll learn more about Maya. Uh, you all will learn more about Maya as you get further into the process. Um, but again, this is going to be a resource that we use for research, uh, for note keeping on different schools. Uh, uh, this is where we'll build our lists of schools that are being considered and schools that will ultimately be applied to. Uh, this provides us with some of the, uh, the resources for the uh, uh, character and personality surveys that we were talking about earlier. And the students uh, uh, will begin to use Maya in August leading into the junior year. So great stuff. Um, I want to talk to y'all a little bit about financial aid, and I know this is not the world's most popular topic, but it's but it's an important one. Um, and so here's the thing uh, with with financial aid, uh, we just really want to urge every family uh, to think about budget considerations, and if you're going to have budget considerations early in the college research process. One of the things that is always very difficult is when a family will have budgetary constraints but doesn't really think about these variables until later on in the process, possibly at a point at which their child has already become heavily vested in the idea of a particular college only to find out that it's one that the family doesn't wanna support because of the costs and they have to pull back on that and that's very difficult for, for the student. So um, it's, very, very possible uh, and not difficult to do to get a good sense for the actual cost of attendance early on in the process to avoid that kind of a difficulty that I was just describing. We want to make a big pitch for the financial aid program that takes place in October. Uh, really worth your time. I also want to make a big pitch for something that you can look at that will really help you with this process, and it's called the net price calculator. And every single college or university has a net price calculator available to you on their website. And they're very user friendly. Uh, you could go home tonight and use the net price calculator probably on multiple schools because every time you do this, it's only going to take about 10 or so minutes of your time, give or take. And the net price calculator um, is going to give you estimated feedback on what that school thinks you as a family would, would uh, uh, ultimately receive in the way of financial aid, if anything. And it will give you the numbers of what the school feels it would be providing. 
and it would also tell you what it believes you would be providing, which currently is referred to as the EFC, the Estimated Family Contribution. And we're introducing you to this term just in time to tell you that don't get too used to it because it's about to go away and colleges are going to start using a different term. I'm not sure offhand what the new term is going to be, but I understand that's being replaced. Regardless, um, it gives you a really good picture. And uh, although the net price calculator is offered to you as an estimate, it's not putting anything in stone, it tends to be really pretty close to right. The other thing I want to tell you about the net price calculator is that it's important to do it school by school. Don't just do one and rely that that's the case across the board, because not every school is using the same formula as it relates to the net price calculator. So um, make sure that for each school you're interested in, you would be looking at that school's net price calculator. Um, the FAFSA, if we can just get back for a quick second, um, the FAFSA and CSS profile, these are um, uh, uh, processes that you'll go through when you're looking for um, need-based financial aid. And so this is financial aid based on your financial situation. But I just want to introduce the fact that there is other scholarship money available in a category that we talk about as merit aid, which has really nothing to do with, with need. Typically, it has to do with you coming in with particular strengths that makes that college want to recruit you, and they offer uh, some kind of a grant as an incentive. But what's important to know is that for some schools, even if you're only looking to be considered for merit aid, they're still looking for you to complete documents like the FAFSA. So um, in most cases, it's going to be important to get those done. Also, keep in mind the importance of deadlines. Um, a financial aid application of FAFSA is no good unless it actually gets turned in and it has to be turned in on time. So that's something you're really going to want to make sure you're paying attention to. All right, and now if we can go to the next one. Yeah, and just real quick here, uh, the philosophy of need-based financial aid. Um, and as the schools consider what the family might be in a position to contribute, it's this three-legged stool as they're looking at current income, savings, and loans that you might be able to have. And um, uh, obviously, if one of these stools uh, is missing, one of these legs of the stool is missing, then uh, you'd have to rely on the other two to hold it up, which is not the ideal situation. But just wanted to give you this, uh, this sort of graphic of what the schools might be looking at from in terms of what the family's responsibility could be. Okay, and uh, let's see if we can go to the next one. Great. So, hey, we've covered a bunch of stuff, and hopefully you all are fired up for what's ahead. And perhaps you're asking, now what? And so next uh, to be looking ahead to uh, as we move deeper into the spring will be the grade 10 academic planning conferences where each student with parents will meet with one of the three of us. And we're going to start talking about some of what's ahead. In particular, we're going to be looking at things like uh, 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 timing for when you should be taking standardized testing, because that is not a one size fits all proposition. And we'll look at your course progression uh, on a student by student basis and make sort of informed and uh, uh, offer some informed advice on what would work best for each student. Um, for example, uh, depending on the progression or where you are with your math, that might indicate taking a test early or waiting. And a little, just real quick, some of the basic uh, thinking there is, ideally, we don't have people preparing for a test when the preparation involves learning the material for the first time. So we want to try to sp space that out, time that in a way that gives everybody their, their best shot at success. Right? You're gonna, as we mentioned earlier, there's the opportunity to follow us on Twitter. And uh, some of you may want to get a jump on the self-reflection by uh, going to a website like 16personalities.com, which is actually kind of a fun one to take a crack at. And yeah, and then moving along, um, junior year, get ready. It's going to be busy. Um, and this slide shows you some of the things that are ahead, um, which include the individual meetings with assigned counselors, as well as the college counseling classes. So in the individual meetings, we're talking about things specific to each student, whereas in the college counseling classes, and there are six of them beginning in January, we uh, cover information that's going to be applicable to, to all of the students. Um, it is a lot, not going to lie, but keep in mind, we're going to be going through this with the students 
and uh, we're going to really be supporting them, having their back through this process the whole way through, and it's going to be a great process. And you know, at the end, the truth is, as busy as it is, it really ought to be an enjoyable, positive experience. If you do it the right way, that's the way it will be, and and we make it our business to do it the right way. And with that, yeah, back over to Jen. Okay, so we make John talk about financial aid, and now I get to talk about testing. I think Darnell's getting off easy tonight. Okay, uh, very quickly, we're almost to the end of the presentation. Thanks for hanging in there. In a few minutes, we're going to open it up for questions. Junior year is testing year. We've heard a lot of parents and students say, oh, but maybe I don't need to take these anymore because all these schools are test optional. Not much is certain for the, cl for the, for the sophomore class. Uh, we're hearing schools set precedent for next year, and some are saying even for the next two years, but we do think every student at Columbus Academy should be preparing for and taking tests. And then if a school is test optional, that's exactly what it is for you. It's optional. You can decide based on your test score and their averages what you want to do. So some basic testing terminology. Everybody knows about the PSAT sophomores. You took this in school and you will take it again in October. This is the one that counts. The one for, for junior year is the one where you can qualify for national merit. And it's also gonna give you a score that you can use to really get ramped up and study for your SAT. So sophomores, you have this score report. You can go into your college board, create a college board account. And if you're really excited to start doing anything this year, uh, this summer, you can go into satpractice.org for some free SAT prep and it uses your individual results. We've talked a lot about this in parent coffees, but we won't, we won't go on and on about it tonight. Okay, um, the SAT and the ACT. So some myths. It used to be uh, people thought the colleges preferred one or the other. That's just not true. Every college accepts both the SAT or the ACT for colleges that still want testing. Um, the writing section is gone. So it's, it's not even an option anymore to sign up and register for it. Test prep, uh, in, our, in our opinion, it's not if, it's a when. So in your grade 10 planning conference, we're going to tell you when to start. John just told you a little bit more about that. We want you to know on average that you know students here take the test two to three times. Uh, you will register for those that are on Saturdays outside of school. We have been an in-school SAT uh, center. So we will have the opportunity for students to take an in-school SAT during a school day at least one time. We know that people's schedules are busy. You have lacrosse tournaments and you have the spring musical and all kinds of things going on. So we have um, partnered with our faculty to have one in-school testing day. You see some information there about fee waivers and accommodations. Those are things you can talk about with an individual counselor during your grade 10 ac academic planning meeting, but we wanna be a resource for you for all things testing. It's not like the first thing everybody wants to talk about, but we think it's something we should be talking about. And I'm gonna turn it over to Darnell to talk a little bit about AP exams. Yes. Exams are um, interesting. These have really sort of changed over time and become a little more important in the college process. Some of you may have heard of subject tests, which have gone away. Um, they're no longer offered. And AP exams are offered more widely. And although they are not required at the admissions process at any place, they can be considered. So what we say about these tests is these are low risk tests. These are ways that students can put their toe into the water of a college exam. And then if they do well, they can report it to colleges and universities. At Columbus Academy, we have 563 exams are gonna be taken on campus this year. And what I'd say is that every student has the opportunity to take AP exams. If you look at through our course curriculum, you say, hey, that's something I really wanna do. Look to advanced statistics that's offered in the senior year or any of the honors classes that are offered in the history departments. There are many ways that students can study for these exams and take them and that's available to all Columbus Academy students. And if you don't like your test score, you don't report it. Next slide. And if all of this gives you the heebie-jeebies talking about um, testing and what you need to do, we just want to let you know that there's an a group called fairtest.org, and they keep track of the schools that um, do not require an SAT or an ACT. What we've seen over time is that then there tends to be more emphasis on the transcript in the absence of scores, but it's, it's something that kids, we are seeing more and more, and this is an upside to this year, 
is that students are saying, hey, I want to take these tests. I want to see how I do, but I'm not going to spend my whole summer after my junior year studying for and retaking this because it's going to be test optional at some of the colleges I'm applying to. We will keep tabs on that for your class as that comes out and we'll report that to you as we see it. Next slide. Okay, so if we are looking big picture, if we're really talking about what matters most, um, it is actually success when you get to college. I think of this as a little bit like how much we spend so much time thinking about when we're pregnant and we don't really think about when the baby comes. I think that this is actually what we wanna be thinking about. When you get to college, what is this going to be like and how are you gonna do the best you can to make sure that you have found a match. Um, I'll tell you that, as you can see here, nationally, about a one third of students transfer and at Columbus Academy, about a one, one tenth of the students transfer. We understand that you may get to a place and say, this is not a good match and I wanna transfer. And we always tell kids, we're college counselors for life. You can call us if you get to college and it doesn't work out for you. But we also want you to think about the ways of reducing the odds of transferring. And we think that that relates to the very basic questions that we stress over and over again for students and families to think about. Location, size, internship, what is the ethos of the campus? What are the extracurricular activities? Because kids learn as much outside of class as they do inside of class. And so we wanna let you know that the basics matter. And we want you all to think about this when you go into this. Next slide. Okay, so you know there's a lot of things that we have learned here and I'm gonna start with one or two of them and then share, have my colleagues share some of them too because I really don't wanna take all the really fun slides. So I will make sure that they get to answer some of them. And what I thought about I would share with you is um, as some of you know, I'm also a grade 10 parent. And I think when I think about this process and where we should be with our kids in terms of colleges and universities, that typically at this point, we are saying over the summer, um, you know, in traveling any time in the spring, if there's a college or university campus that is um, on your way somewhere or might be of interest to you or down the street from where you live, this might be a time to go see one of those schools because this is a little bit like an open house. You want to go and see a couple of open houses before you decide, you know, when you're really going to start your housing search. And what's important about this to think about is I, in our experience, it's really undermining to confidence of students if you start with colleges with a really low admit rate. You want to start with colleges, we say, with that admit over 50% of their applicants, because that way students are thinking about and parents are thinking about, oh, this is a college that you know, I can see myself on this campus and college seems really fun and they don't have the stress of, am I gonna be able to get in? So what we want you to do is do exploratory work, but start with just getting kids excited about the opportunity of looking at colleges and universities. Okay, Jen, I'm gonna pass it to you next. Okay, so I was just texting with a parent at the beginning of this program, um, another faculty member, and we were talking about the timeline. Like, and I said, oh, is, is your child really excited about this? And she said, actually, she's really concentrating on getting her driver's license, totally age appropriate. We know that parents and students have different timelines. Some of you as parents are like, let's go. Like, I am pumped about that program. I'm gonna go on to the 16 personalities. I'm gonna go on the College Board website. And your kid is like, dude, I'm not interested. I'm, I wanna talk about getting my driver's license hours, um, my art project. Um, I'm just wanna like think about my junior speech for next year. It's okay to have different timelines. Um, the packet of information that we are gonna share with you, we have a timeline that has the markers that you should hit. And if you fall behind, if you're missing one, we'll let you know, but there's no need to speed stuff up. We talked about the marathon versus the sprint. This is a marathon. It is going to take 14 months. Don't start the hardcore college search too early. Um, I'm going to do one more and then pass it over to you, John. So John and Darnell have both done this as parents. I have not. So they can give you some words of wisdom as a parent. Um, we do think that spending lots of money on things that you think could help they typically don't. Two examples that we can think of are summer programs and independent consultants. In our experience, we have never seen those pay off. 
Um, we have seen uh, investments in test prep and college visits during the junior year make a difference. So junior year, spring break, that will be the time that you are gonna spend some time, energy, and, and quite frankly, money visiting college campuses. Um, and John, I'll pass it to you. Okay, thanks, Jen. Yeah, so I wanna just uh, talk a little bit more about that second to last bullet on the, on the slide. Enjoying oh, you're, taking the this you're taking the good one. <laughs> enjoying this. Hey, I had to talk about financial aid 101, so I deserve this. But, <laughs> no, but seriously, you all, enjoy this experience together as, a, as parent and child. And something I want to offer, not only as a college counselor, but also as a parent, and this is for the parents in the audience this evening. Um, you know, when we talk about enjoying this experience, sometimes parents are going to say, well, that sounds funny because it seems like a lot of this is going to just be difficult. And, uh, and I'm not going to lie, some of this is, is challenging, but what's especially challenging, uh, what at least was in my experience, I'm sure it'll be for, for, for you all as well, is the point at which your child leaves home and goes off to college and you're adjusting to this new role as a parent where your child's no longer at home um, and, and you miss each other. Um, and so I want you to really consider making the most of this time and enjoying this experience together because it really can be a great time and a great opportunity to bond. Yeah, that's great, John. And I think the other thing I'll say is how parents talk about this process and the questions they ask other parents and the questions that they ask their children matter. Um, I am speaking you know, primarily to the parents in this group, but children by and large really want their parents to be proud of them. And this is something I can't really overstate is they feel like they're disappointing you in this process, something that's out of their control, then um, that can be really hard. Instead, what you wanna look at and you wanna think about is all the milestones that they take in this process, um, writing essays, researching colleges, finding that list of schools they're gonna to apply to and praising them for their engagement in this world, putting themselves out there in the world, in the college admissions world, to let other people decide if they're going to be admitted or not. And I think recognizing that it's not the outcome or the particular school or the bumper sticker that matters, but the growth of your child in this process. Um, well, it's getting to the time that it's an hour and we really want to thank you all for listening. We always want to keep our programs to one hour, but we will open it up for uh, chat questions because we love talking about college counseling and we can certainly stay here um, and answer questions for you all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you on Zoom and hopefully in person soon. It's hard for us not to see you all here for this program. Thank you, everybody. So we're gonna open the chat and as we're opening the chat and you're populating that, if you wanna sign off, sign off. Um, but we're gonna open the chat in a minute. I just wanna um, give you a, a quick refresher. These are our email addresses. We know many of you as friends and um, fellow parents, because you know we're parents at the school as well, we would ask that you not use our cell phone to text us questions. Texting is a personal question like, hey, would you like to have a cocktail, Darnell? Sure, I'd love to have a cocktail. But an email is where you would send us a question about like registering for the SAT, uh, for all the professional stuff we would like to keep in our emails. If you have a general question, not for a specific college counselor, but in these early stages uh, with the yellow stars, that's Jen Conti, Ms. Conti. So send an email there if you have a general question. If she can't answer it, she will farm it out to one of the three college counselors and we promise um, to get back to you in, be in between one to two business days. But we want to be a resource for you. Never sit and, and wonder. And to that end, let's, let's open up the chat, y'all. Okay, good. I see the first question and I might take it and then see if you all can... There are other things. Is the uptick in applications related to students deferring from last year because of COVID? Um, and do you expect it to return to more normal levels in two years? First of all, very good question. And, um, and what we have heard from colleges and universities is actually not many students deferred for the year. There were very small numbers of students that deferred. What happened 
a little bit in some places, and we heard this just the other day from Ohio State, is that they, last year, they got kind of panicked around this time of year and admitted many more students unsure of who would come given the situation. So they're actually over enrolled right now. So they're admitting a smaller class in this class, class of 2021, in order to make up for some of those numbers. We also see as another huge factor, the um, test optional. Uh, I think that's the single lar largest factor that we see um, as uh, shaping the increased numbers at many colleges and universities. And we think that's because in the past, students would look at a number and say, hey, I don't have a chance. There's um, no way you know, I'm gonna even apply to that school. And now if it's test optional, every student who's graduating from high school has a chance and um, many are putting in their applications. In terms of changing in the next two years, I would say I think that's going to depend on what happens with test optional and what happens in terms of who enrolls in these colleges and universities, because college and universities are often talking about trying to find students that um, are the first in the family to go to college or you know didn't see themselves in college. If, if test optional allowed them to widen the base of students that applied, they are probably going to stick with it. We'll stay on top of it and we'll keep you informed. Uh, the next question is, how many colleges would you recommend your students to visit? So remember, this is mostly going to happen in the junior year. So if you are a sophomore um, right now, maybe one or two this summer, remember that many, many college campuses are actually not open. Um, so don't go hog wild and plan a big college tour. In the junior year, really um, spring break is the, the main visit time. Um, our students will visit anywhere between, you know, we have some students who will visit five or six schools and feel like, okay, I've got it. I found one early decision. And we have some students who will visit 12 or 15 schools. Um, our students will be researching a list between, uh, Jarnell and John, back me up here, sometimes 25, 30 colleges. They're just researching those schools, um, sometimes attending Zoom information sessions, meeting with the college admissions reps who come to campus, but they will narrow that down before they go off to visit colleges. The reason you don't want to do a full-blown college search right now is when you're thinking like, am I in the, am I in the ranges? Your kids don't even have test scores yet. So doing a full-blown college search right now would be a total waste of time and wholly inappropriate. Okay, so John, I'll, I'll let you have that next one there. Sure. Um, asking about how many rec letters are needed for college applications. And in truth, it, it can vary slightly uh, from school to school, uh, but typically uh, the, the most that you would want would be uh, three letters, two from teachers, and then the third letter would be the counselor recommendation that would come from one of us. Um, there are some schools that will only accept one teacher rec, and, and, and there are also some that accept none. Um, but uh, usually we're talking in uh, uh, either one or two letters uh, from teachers and then the counselor letters, so for a total of three. And, and, and one other point I want to I want to add to this is oftentimes students are wondering, well, should I just go ahead and get more? Will, will more be better? Uh, and the answer to that is really no. Uh, and in fact, um, the, it's important to consider in context, the colleges are getting all these thousands of applications, the admissions officers are extremely busy. And when they say we want two teacher recs and instead you send three or four, um, sometimes that's interpreted as, well, why can't you follow directions and you've just given us extra paper and it actually ends up hurting the application. Um, of course, this is case by case, but typically I think that's the most solid answer. Yes, so um, it's great. The next question is about early decision. Um, that's, that's a topic that we will cover in depth with juniors and junior families, just so you know, there are different application timelines. Kids can apply to different uh, to colleges, uh, different times in the year. Just so you know, at Columbus Academy, um, really it's 100% of our students are applying by November 1. We typically see about 25 to 30% of our students applying under some kind of early decision round. That can sometimes go up to 40 students. We saw it, um, you know, the number go up this year to about 40% um, because students were uh, interested in looking at that. 
We, um, we would say in terms of how helpful it is in admitting a student, if a college has early decision, in almost all cases, it's extremely helpful to apply in an early decision round. We in fact just did an exercise with our junior class so they could look at some of the data to see the admit rates for early decision versus the admit rates for regular decision. This is not something that sophomore parents need to worry about um, at this point, but we will counsel all kids and families to these options and let them know about what this looks like for the colleges and universities that they are interested in. Did I miss anything? Good. Okay. Um, I'll do a couple of quick, easy ones. Uh, the question is, if you don't visit a school, will they reduce will they reduce my chances? I think you mean chances of being accepted. So that really depends. If this, we will educate you during the junior night presentation about the term demonstrated interest. Some colleges consider demonstrated interest. Are you joining the mailing list? Are you meeting with the representative when they come to our school? And do you visit campus? Some schools don't even take that in, into consideration. Places like Stanford and Harvard, they don't keep track of that. They don't care about demonstrated interest. They're just taking who they want. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, but demonstrated interest, that's, that is considered by some schools. And in the example that we showed you going into the common data set, you can see if they take that into consideration. Um, another easy question about how many interviews in person or alumni do students have that depends on how many schools you apply to that have interviews the interview is really something that we see on the decline, especially alumni interviews those are really things that were just used to keep alumni interested in their school not really evaluative interviews that had any meat to them. Um, so we do prep our kids in the junior college counseling class we do practice college interviews so that they're all prepared. I'll give you an example. I have a senior boy in my advisory who said, uh, I think in October, he said, I never had to do a college interview and I was all ready to do it. And then he applied to a school and he got an, he was, he got a request for an interview for the honors college at a particular school. He went back to the Google classroom, looked at the questions and was prepared to do that. So sometimes it doesn't happen until the very end or after you apply or you're applying to an honors college, but that's really not um, a huge part of the college admissions process anymore. Okay, I'm gonna jump in on this question uh, about uh, what percentage of kids are undecided about their elective choice. And I believe you're asking about, uh, are undecided about their curriculum or perhaps their major. And of course the actual percentage will, will vary from year to year and class to class. But I would tell you that the truth is that um, the, the large majority of students are, are undecided about what they're going to uh, major in and exactly which courses they're gonna take uh, before they get to college and uh, will use the early parts of their college experience, the first year and parts of the second year to help sort that out. That is very commonplace, not a problem. Some schools will ask you uh, for a particular major in the application process because um, that will be a matter of which college within the university are you gonna to apply to. And if that's the case, it's going to be important to identify at least what you think you want to major in. But many schools, most schools aren't, offer, aren't asking for something that specific. Some schools will ask you simply, what do you think you want to major in? And, uh, um, and one of the options will be undecided. And when somebody is well and truly undecided, um, that is not a down check in the application. That does not hurt them. Um, if they were to be in an interview with an admissions officer and the question was, what do you want to major in? And the students discuss is not yet being decided. That's, that's okay. If the, if, the, if the question was more generically, tell me about some things that interest you. Well, that's going to be important to be able to articulate. If you say, well, I don't have any interest. I'm not sure that that would be a problem, but that's a completely uh, different matter. And John, I think I would just add to that that um, we would do a lot of work with students to figure this out. And also we help them with this closer to time because mm -hmm. there are colleges and universities that pay very close attention to your major and actually may um, uh, you know, admit students as we talked about that in terms of their institutional priority. They may have a big business school and have many, many students who apply to the business school. And if a kid checks business, but is not one of their stellar applicants, they may not get in. So I would say that this is something that students need to reflect on and need to reflect on in their junior year. And families should be aware of that as well, but we'll spend time on that. Jen or John, anything else I missed about that? Uh, 
Okay. Um, so in terms of contacting colleges and universities to arrange or tour, um, what office should you contact? It's the Office of Admissions. And the Office of Admissions at this point, um, they are in many places saying, um, you know, we're only having students online virtual visits. Um, many other places are saying we're open, you can come to campus, but we limit the number of visits we can have. And so this is, it's it typically in a typical year, it would just be go to the office admissions, click a, a calendar and sign up for an information session and a tour. This year, it's a little different with the virtual visits. Um, and I'm, we're just not sure how that'll happen so much with your class, but certainly making that contact and putting the information in that website is important. Um, the next question, it says, you mentioned investing in test prep. Uh, would you have any recommendations on which ones? You bet we do. And we're gonna give them to you during your grade 10 academic planning conference in April. We will have a handout for you. We will give you a personal recommendation. We'll give you lots of options. We like to give different price points, um, not necessarily a recommendation. We'll just give you options that Columbus Academy students have used and uh, that we have kind of vetted a little bit. Um, I think we have time for one or two more. Uh, want me to take another quick, easy one here, guys? Sure. Uh, if you apply during early decision and get rejected, are you still able to apply again to the same school during the normal application time? No. Once you're rejected, you're rejected. You could go somewhere else and then apply as a transfer, but once you are, if they, if they still wanted to consider your application, they would defer you instead of rejecting you. Uh, I think we answered the question about visiting and contacting admissions. Um, the question, there's a question about, you know, who would you recommend we meet during college visits? As a sophomore, I would not recommend doing anything else besides a tour and an info session. This is way too early. Admissions offices do not want to set up meetings with um, faculty members and students. They are just trying to save those visits right now, quite frankly, for seniors who are making a decision. Many of our seniors have not had a chance to visit colleges. They do not want to entertain sophomores at this stage. You can do a, maybe, a, maybe a tour if they have room, but um, don't be surprised if you kind of get the Heisman, if they're pushing you away as a sophomore, they are dying to get the seniors on campus and to yield them. Remember the word yield? They're trying to yield them and get them to campus uh, for all the admitted students. So at this point, maybe a college tour, maybe an info session online, but um, we will talk much more about uh, in-depth college visits for juniors during the junior college night. Um, and I think that's about it. Yeah, good. So I just wanted to say um, that as we mentioned those academic planning conferences, uh, that is a time when we will review schedules for next year. But if you find yourself in advance saying, hey, I don't know about you know courses or something like that, the kids went to a great panel today. Um, advisors are really helpful. The course guide is really helpful. And we will review everything related to decisions in enough time to change any of that. This is just initial course planning. And then in academic conferences, we'll be in and work with you on some of that. So you'll get some individual attention on that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.